So, uh, without further ado, we've got uh, in our third session here, we've got um, Greta Temple and Elizabeth uh, Jackson. Yes? Okay. And they're presenting uh, their paper on um, permissivism, underdetermination, and religious disagreement. Thank you. Well, thanks for having us. We're really thankful to be here. Thanks, Greg, for all of your work putting all this together and the really impressive program that we can't believe how well graphically designed it is. It's all beautiful. Really, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Our graphics department. It's all. Awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. So thank you all for being here. We're really excited to talk about this. Um, so today we want to talk about um, two theses, well, three theses, really. Um, but the first thesis we want to talk about is the thesis of uniqueness, which is on your handout. Um, and that's the thesis in epistemology that necessarily for every body of evidence E and proposition P, there is one unique rational doxastic attitude any agent with E can take for P, towards P. And we think uniqueness is interesting for the purposes of this conference, because if uniqueness is true, and someone with your evidence disagrees with you, and you're believing rationally, that convinces you to think that they're believing irrationally. So uniqueness rules out the possibility of reasonable disagreement. That's another way of putting it. Um, and some authors, um, Mike Bergman and Stefan Reining, have argued um, that in cases of religious disagreement, um, the topic of this conference, that, um, in that in cases like that, a theist has access to some special sort of evidence, either by some sort of religious experience or divine revelation. And so in any religious disagreement, it's not very often going to be the case that theists and atheists or members of religious disagreement have the same evidence. Um, and we have decided to um, assume for the purposes of argument and for the purposes of being open-minded that um, people in religious disagreement can have the same evidence. So we're sort of making the assumption on the behalf of open-mindedness um, and fairness to those who may not have access to things like religious experience, that members of religious disagreement do have the same evidence. So that's sort of going to be an assumption going forward. Um, so accepting uniqueness gives us a barrier to open-mindedness, because if part of what being open-minded in the face of disagreement means is thinking that someone who disagrees with me can be rational, uniqueness says that in any religious disagreement I have, and uh, that's on the basis of a shared body of evidence, at least one person in the disagreement is being irrational. Sometimes it could be both of us, but at least one of us is being irrational. That seems like a, bar a barrier to us um, to be believing open-mindedly, behaving open-mindedly. So in this paper, we want to explore the denial of uniqueness, um, which this is the thesis of permissivism. And permissivism is the view that for any body of, for some body of evidence E, um, there is more than one doxastic attitude that, ca that can be rationally adopted towards that body of evidence. Um, and this literature has been really lively in the last 10 years in epistemology, so there's lots of arguments against uniqueness and on behalf of permissivism. Um, but we want to take the attack of thinking about how, thinking about permissivism in terms of another thesis, underdetermination, that's often talked about in the philosophy of science, can strengthen the case for permissivism and thereby give us reason to reject uniqueness and be open-mindedness, open-minded in the face of religious disagreement. We also want to um, explore how permissivism interacts with evidentialism. Um, so our thesis is that thinking of permissivism in terms of underdetermination can strengthen the case for permissivism. Um, and the upshot of our argument for this conference, um, as I've already foreshadowed, is that first of all, permissivism is likely true. And second, if permissivism is true, we have reason to think that people who disagree with us about religious matters are not necessarily believing irrationally. They might be, but they're not necessarily believing irrationally. So we can be open-minded in the midst of religious disagreement because we can recognize that the agents we disagree with are not necessarily behaving in an epistemically irrational fashion. So the outline is sort of as follows. I'm going to talk about there's lots of versions of permissivism and versions of underdetermination that we might be concerned with. So I'll spell out which versions I'm concerned, we're concerned with in this paper. And then Liz is going to discuss the relationship between permissivism and underdetermination and suggest some ways that thinking about under term, understanding permissivism as a form of underdetermination can give us reason to accept permissivism and th thus be open-minded in religious disagreement. Um, so section two on your handout, permissivism and underdetermination, defining the terms. So as I've already said, permissivism is the view that for some body of evidence, there is more than one rational doxastic attitude anyone with that evidence can have towards the pro that proposition, towards proposition P. Um, and so I'm going to discuss a couple, there's, different, there's a lot of different ways you can cash out permissivism and uniqueness, um, and there are three I want to mention first. First, we could cash out permissivism in terms of credences or degree attitudes instead of full beliefs. So you might think that permissivism um, allows for there to be a range of different degrees of uh, belief or, or credences if you're a credence person, 
Um, or you might think that permissivism applies to belief, disbelief, and suspension of judgment. And we're going to remain neutral between those two versions of permissivism and uniqueness, the credence version and the belief version, or the coarse grained attitude version. Um, but we know that this could, ha which depending on which version of those theses you adopt, it could have some implications for um, our arguments and what follows. So you can ask us in Q&A, we can talk about that later. Um, second, there's an important distinction in the literature between intrapersonal permissivism and interpersonal permissivism. And intrapersonal permissivism is the view that for one rational agent, there are multiple doxastic attitudes that agent could adopt towards a body of evidence. So we're talking about intrapersonal is talking about one agent. And we think our argument can strengthen the case for intrapersonal permissivism. Uh, but the other version is interpersonal permissivism, and that's the view that different agents can have different attitudes towards the same body of evidence. And we're going to focus on interpersonal permissivism in this paper because we think that's the obvious one of a form of concern um, when we talk about religious disagreement. We seldom talk about disagreements with ourselves. We mostly talk about <laughs> disagreements with other people. Um, so we're going to be talking about interpersonal permissivism. Um, third, you can distinguish between extreme and moderate forms of permissivism. Um, of inter interpersonal permissivism. So extreme interpersonal permissivism says that for some body of evidence E, it could be rational for one agent to believe P or the other agent to believe not P. So you have sort of an extreme disagreement. Um, but moderate interpersonal permissivism says that it could be rational for a, given some body of evidence for one agent to believe P or not P and the other agent to suspend judgment about P. Um, and we think that our argument, I have a paper defending extreme permissivism, and she has a paper defending moderate permissivism. So we're going to remain neutral between those, ter between those theses. But we think that um, our arguments can support both of them. But if you're not convinced by the extreme version, you can still adopt the moderate version and still be a permissivist. Um, and there are also credence versions of these different um, theses that either allow how wide your range of um, credence is that's permitted by the body of evidence. All right, so the final is the, what we marked as the important qualification on um, under permissivism. Um, and most permissivists, in fact, all permissivists that I'm aware of, are very cautious to say that they don't think that necessarily that all bodies of evidence are permissive. So some permissivists that we know say, if your body of evidence entails a hypothesis or your hypothesis entails the evidence, then that's not a permissive case. You've only got one, there's only one rational attitude that's available to you in that case. So if you can accept permissivism and think there are some cases where there's just one rational attitude to adopt in response to a body of evidence, um, and think that there are other bodies of evidence that there are more than one, there's more than one rational doxastic attitude. Um, all right. So um, in epistemological context, permissivism is actually quite controversial. As I've already foreshadowed, there are lots of people who stridently defend uniqueness and deny permissivism. There are people who seem to be threatened by permissivism. There are people who seem to be threatened by uniqueness. So this is an ongoing debate in epistemology. Um, and that's one dissimilarity between permissivism and underdetermination. So there are not so many forms of underdetermination in the literature and philosophy of science. It tends to be a term we use a lot, and then we um, end up talking about two different things um, under the same term. So in this paper, we want to think about a very minimal thesis of underdetermination, and we're calling it practical underdetermination. And that's on your handout. That's the thesis that in theory choice in domain D, the evidence E, which is presently available to us, does not direct us to accept one of the theories in P and D over its rivals. Um, and most of the time in philosophy of science, the thesis of practical underdetermination gets off the ground when we think about the borders of our scientific knowledge. And at the borders of our scientific knowledge, we're often trying to understand phenomena we don't know a lot about. And we're advancing theories to account for that phenomena. But we recognize, scientists recognize a lot of the time, that the evidence they currently have access to doesn't justify them in accepting one of those brand new emerging theories over its rivals. And they call that, we would call that situation practically underdetermined, so that's what we're calling it. Um, and so this brings us to another our, our important qualification on your handout again, that um, I don't know of a single scientist who's going to say that all theory choices are practically underdetermined. It's a local rather than a global thesis. So um, accepting that practical underdetermination is true just commits you to the view that currently some theory choices, especially those at the border of our scientific knowledge, we don't have enough evidence currently available to us that's going to justify us in accepting one theory over its rivals. So while permissivism is a fairly controversial thesis, practical underdetermination is not. In fact, in the philosophy of science, Philip Kitcher calls practical underdetermination familiar and unthreatening. 
And one of the main criticisms when you discuss, when, when practical underdetermination gets discussed in the literature and philosophy of science is that it proves too little. It's really uninteresting for philosophers because it's so minimal and so uncontroversial. And we think this is an interesting dissimilarity between these very similar theses, under practical underdetermination permissivism, um, that practical underdetermination doesn't seem to be controversial. Okay, so now I'll turn things over to Liz to think about the relation. Awesome, thanks so much, Greta. So now we are on the back side of your handout, um, section three, the relationship between permissivism and determination. So what we want to think about here is, I guess, the ways that epistemic permissivism can be construed as an underdetermination thesis. And so we sort of put one way you might think about that on your handout as practical permissivism underdetermination. And that says, possibly for some body of evidence, E in proposition P, E underdetermines a single rational doxastic attitude one ought to take towards P. Uh, in other words, E doesn't give us a reason, an epistemic reason specifically, to hold a particular doxastic attitude towards P over at least some of its rivals. And so, one thing that sort of Greta alluded to that's interesting to note here is that if a minimal kind of underdetermination thesis is true, then permissivism is true. So when you're comparing sort of underdetermination in the scientific case and permissivism in the epistemic case, the main difference between the two theses is actually that scientific underdetermination states that evidence un underdetermines a scientific theory or hypothesis choice, and epistemic permissivism states that evidence underdetermines a doxastic attitude. But actually, in many ways, these theses are really, really similar. We were actually like, are these like the same? <laughs> Um, so one thing we were trying to think about is maybe there are ways you could state underdetermination even more generally, something like x underdetermines y, if and only if, but we sort of tried to do this and it was difficult. Um, so it's interesting to note that underdetermination in science and permissivism in epistemology just have quite a bit in common. So like, like we said in the definitions, one important thing in common is they're both sort of focusing on the underdetermination by evidence. So whether a body of evidence gives us reason to hold a doxastic attitude or to accept a scientific hypothesis. Um, so one thing I want to think about here is what permissivism construed as an underdetermination thesis actually commits us to. And one thing that's interesting to note is that at permissivism as a thesis in epistemology doesn't tell us that what attitude we ought to take all things considered, is fully underdetermined. It's just a thesis about our evidence. So it might be that all the facts about your epistemic situation determine a rational attitude, even if your evidence does not. And so this leads us to what I think is an important distinction that I think some people in the permissivism literature have not paid much attention to, as they should have. And it's going to play a big role in the rest of our paper. So this is the distinction between evidence underdetermination permissivism and full underdetermination permissivism. So evidence underdetermination permissivism says E, our body of evidence, doesn't give us an epistemic reason to accept a particular doxastic attitude over its rivals. And this is what's traditionally understood in the literature as kind of the basic and minimal permissivist thesis. But this thesis is consistent with saying that your evidence plus something else might determine or um, force you on pains of irrationality to accept a particular doxastic attitude over its rivals. So you could go more extreme than this though. And this is what I think is interesting and important to think about. You could say, no, it's not your epistemic situation and your evidence, think about all the facts. Uh, there's not any reason to accept a particular doxastic at attitude over its rivals. And sometimes your situation is just fully underdetermined. So both of these theses are versions of permissivism, but the full underdetermination says sometimes which attitude you should hold is fully underdetermined, and the evidence one says no, it's just that thinking about evidence alone underdetermines it, but it might be that evidence plus epistemic standards, once you have both of those in play, that will give you a unique doxastic attitude to uphold. So I think this sort of points to the way in which the permissivism literature has been really, really focused on evidence and the nature of evidence, but maybe haven't paid as much attention to other facts about your epistemic situation, like maybe your epistemic standards, that could spit out a unique rational attitude. So thinking about undetermination and what it says about permissivism, I think 
can strengthen the case for permissivism because it clarifies exactly what permissivists are claiming and what they don't have to be committed to. So, actually, I'm going to talk about that in a second. First, I'm going to talk about um, the relationship. So now we're in section four, the relationship between practical determination in science and epistemic permissivism. So one thing that's sort of interesting and brief to note, and I think gives us sort of a prima facie reason to accept under, or sorry, accept epistemic permissivism, is that all these scientists in the philosophy of science literature, or philosophers of science, um, you know, they're saying, look, practical determination is almost like truly true. Like, it's like very obvious given our scientific evidence that, you know, at least in certain situations, there can't be, we can't be forced to accept one theory hypothesis over the titles, right? But then I think epistemologists who might not be paying as much attention to those debates um, are having all these other debates about permissivism and uniqueness. But I think if we paid more attention to what's going on in science, we might see that, look, we actually have a pretty good reason given what's going on in science and given those bodies of evidence to think permissivism is actually true. So Greta kind of discussed this earlier in some science and people who talk about it. But I think this at least gives us sort of a prima facie case to think permissivism is true, especially since like we said earlier, permissivism is just an existential claim. It's just a claim about some bodies of evidence, not all bodies of evidence. So, look, these ones in science, those <laughs> ones might be permissive, right? So, that's sort of a first way I think under determination can strengthen the case for permissivism. Okay, so the second way um, has to do with this distinction I was talking about between evidence under determination permissivism and flow under determination permissivism. So, one of the first objections, and a very common objection that a lot of people make to permissivism is this. If a body of evidence can permit more than one dogmatic attitude, then what prevents a rational agent from just moving in between those attitudes? If my evidence permits theism and atheism and agnosticism, then I could just like be a theist and then like be an atheist and then be an atheist and just move around, right? Because like my evidence leaves it open. So, the, like I guess the challenge for the permissivist is to explain why random toggling between attitudes like that seems irrational. Um, because they say, look, they're all permitted given your evidence. So that's when I think this distinction between evidence under determination and permissivism, these are like really mouthful <laughs> uh, <laughs> principles, sorry, and full under determination permissivism can come into play. Because when you look at what permissivists are actually claiming, they're just making a claim about your body of evidence. But it might be that when you factor in my evidence and my epistemic standards, I can't toggle. Because even if my evidence leaves it open, whether I you know, could be a theist or an atheist or agnostic, it might be that given my epistemic standards and my evidence, I should just hold to one of those attitudes. And Greta might share evidence with me, but she might have a different epistemic standard and thus come to a different conclusion on the matter. I'm going to talk a little bit more about implications for open-mindedness. But it's interesting that when you think about what the permissivist is actually committed to, they don't have to say that full undetermination permissivism is true, just that evidence undetermination. And this sort of, I think, gives us uh, a clear way out of the toggling objection. And I think sort of, some people have responded to the toggling objection, but I think this shows sort of the fundamental reason that the toggling objection is misguided. So, yes. Great. So, you don't have to worry about the toggling objection <laughs> unless you're an evidentialist. So that's what I'm going to go next. So, permissivism and evidentialism, 4.3. So evidentialism, at least what we're going to assume it means, is which doxastic attitude someone ought to hold supervenes only on their evidence. So evidence is the only thing that tells us what we should believe or what creed we should have. That's what we're going to think of until this. Is. There's probably other versions, and we can talk about that more in Q&A, but we'll just say that's what it is for now. So one thing that's interesting to note is that if you're a permissivist and you're an evidentialist, you're going to have to be a full underdetermination permissivist, right? Because you can't appeal to things besides someone's body of evidence that, that justify them holding one attitude over another. So, look, an evidentialist is saying all that determines what attitude you ought to hold is your evidence. And they can't appeal to other factors like epistemic standards or you know, whatever else about an agent's epistemic situation to explain why they should hold one attitude rather than another. Evidence is all you've got, and the evidence leaves it open, so it's left open. So here's two reasons I think this is interesting. One, evidentialists can be permissivists. <laughs> and that might be obvious, but I feel like 
when you read the literature on this, almost all of initialists just go straight in for uniqueness right away, and we want to say, carve out some space for you to hold both views at the same time. So that's kind of cool. You can be an evidentialist and a permissivist. Um, but the second upshot is that if you want to accept both evidentialism and permissivism, you're going to need a new response to Pauli construction, right? Because if you're appealing to things besides evidence, like epistemic standards, to explain why we shouldn't toggle, the evidentialists can't do that because they think, no, what attitude you hold only supervenes on your evidence. So, so there's, I mean, I think there's things they can say here. They could, I'm actually sort of sympathetic to the idea that toggling might not be epistemically irrational in a permissive case, but maybe it's just practically irrational. So, you know, there, it's not like it's, you know, a totally bad combination of views, but it is the, this specific response I talked about to the toggling objection is one they cannot appeal to. So I think that's kind of interesting too. Okay, great. So a couple different upshots we wanted to think about kind of for the purposes and theme of this conference, which is open-mindedness, especially in like religious disagreement cases. So the first is that the point I think people have made in literature already, but look, if you're in a permissive case, you might not be required to defer to someone else's attitude, even if they are your epistemic peer and they disagree with you. And David talked a lot about epistemic peers before, but basically they're people who are equally likely to have gotten the question right as you, they share evidence, they have similar reliability, that kind of thing. But if you're in a permissive case, you don't necessarily have to defer to their point of view on pains of irrationality. So think about maybe an example from science. Scientists who are equally smart and maybe even plausibly epistemic peers often disagree. But it doesn't seem like they're being irrational. They disagree about like who killed the dinosaurs, for example. So in scientific practice, when things are underdetermined in this way, you don't have to defer to your epistemic peers. And we think that it's interesting to think about a similar response in the epistemic case. So look, if you're in a permissive case, there's not one single rational response you have to have given your evidence. Thus, you aren't required to defer to your disagreeing peers who share your evidence on pains of irrationality. But if you share epistemic standards or other facts about your epistemic case, then deferring to them might be required. And, and, and I think part of this also depends on your definition of epistemic peer. And there's actually been mutual, probably inconsistent definitions of epistemic peer given in the literature. So some of it's going to hang on what exactly, who exactly counts as your epistemic peer. But there's at least some logical space for rational peer disagreement. Um, if you are in permissivism. So this can allow us to be rationally open-minded, not just in disagreement in general, but also in religious disagreement. So we can acknowledge that people who disagree with us about religious matters are epistemic peers. They're not missing out on evidence, but the evidence just underdetermines a single rational response. Um, I think this is interesting, but it does require some controversial assumptions. So one, it requires the assumption that our shared evidence with respect to whatever religious matter we're thinking about, uh, the distance at which religion is true, is permissive. And some people might think, oh yeah, permissivism is true, but like God's existence isn't one of those permissive cases. Or like whether certain religion is true isn't one of those permissive cases. So I think that's that's controversial, and that's a place you could push back. Um, and it also requires that whoever disagreeing with you doesn't necessarily share facts, um, or sorry, doesn't necessarily share all the facts about your epistemic situation with you. Or it requires that full underdetermination of permissivism is true. So there are going to be some potentially controversial assumptions for exactly how we're gonna, you know, how open-minded we can be given this kind of framework. But nonetheless, we hope to have painted a sketch of how underdetermination in science can strengthen the case for epistemic permissivism and shown how this provides at least one way we can rationally be open-minded in the face of religious disagreement. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes. <laughs> so I have uh, a question slash misunderstanding, maybe. Um, so as I was looking at this, I thought, and this, I don't do philosophy or science at all. Um, so, <coughs> but as I was uh, reading Practical Underdetermination, I took it that what was going on um, was... We have our evidence, and our evidence doesn't support any theory conclusively. Um, but I did not take it that that meant, well, then just believe whichever theory you want. 
Um, and you're shaking your head like that's correct. Okay, good. Um, and so I was like, well, that seems uh, really different than permissivism, which says, um, well, it doesn't say believe whichever one you want, but it does say there actually are multiple options. I took it that with under determination, there was one option, suspension of, uh, of belief. Now, when it comes to uh, which doxastic attitude you have, like suspension isn't really an option because you, you just have to either believe, disbelieve, or suspend, or have a credence somewhere in it. Um, and so maybe you just say, well, that's, that's the reason why under determination here, like, uh, spits out permissivism because you have to do something. Um, but I was wondering if, if what you would say to someone who thought, well, that's, that's an important difference, and that's why there's a disanalogy here, and why we can't just read off permissivism, or uh, maybe not even, you know, that's probably not your claim, but why we should be a little cautious about uh, saying, well, we can apply the lessons from under determination to permissivism. Um, so, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's kind of a ramble and jumble of thoughts. So. Um, so, an interesting thing about the science case is that um, after you get you uh, like you you sit down with your fellow scientists and you look at uh, let's say I work in fossil paleontology so you're looking at uh, a body of paleontological evidence right, dinosaurs dinosaurs yes <laughs> um, and they're looking at dinosaur evidence and the biologists I paleontologists I read they say okay look this evidence the evidence the little fragments of bone we have don't seem to really convince us you know they're not we we agree that they're not conclusive in any direction. Um, but instead, what we're going to do is add something we're called the theoretical virtue. And um, my favorite, the you know, one paleontologist says, my favorite theoretical virtue is simplicity. And the other one says, my favorite theoretical virtue is explanatory scope. And one of them believes one theory, and the other believes it's totally different and consistent theories. Um, and so I think all that, analogously, I think all that permissivism is saying, like Liz was talking about, is just that it's not your evidence, your body of evidence, that's, that's determining your doxastic attitude. And so I think that there, I think that um, there are like also also lots of arguments of falsity of science that you just simply can't suspend judgment in a case of scientific underdetermination, and that to do so would have cost us most of the scientific theories that we now know and love. Um, so there's practical under arguments against it, and there's also a sense in which there, yeah, I think that, that they actually function quite similarly. I don't know if that answered your question. No, I, okay. I mean, that does. Um, so, I mean, maybe a suggestion of or just a question. Yes. Um, I mean, if, if what you're saying is right, um, it, it looks like people on the ground uh, are permissivists. Yes. Yes. So, uh, yeah. 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 Yes. 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 Thank that, you. That seems like a, a point that, yes. that could strengthen yeah. your case here, right? Yeah. I actually have a paper where I'm arguing that right okay. now. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Can I add one thing really yes, quick? Totally. Another, I mean, another thing that came out of your question that I think is important too is, in in one way, you actually gave an argument that people who are fans of uniqueness give, and that argument is if you're body of evidence permits believing P and withholding and believing not P, you should just suspend judgment. Yeah. Feldman actually says this. Right. Yeah. So I think one way, I mean, you could take it, just take it analogous all the way and say, well, oh no, this just also supports uniqueness. And this is one reason why, like we talked about the difference between um, extreme permissivism that says all three can be permitted versus moderate. And so I think this is the reason some people want to say, no, we just want to go in for the more moderate version, because if like all three are permitted, then you should be like, well, and then suspend judgment. So anyway, but yeah, yeah, so good question. I follow up on the same sort of subject, right? So suppose I've got two hypotheses that are mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. but also exhaustive, hypothesis one, hypothesis two, and in a good little Bayesian, and probability of H1 given E is the same as probability of H2 given E, they're, so they're both 0.5, okay. right? Um, it seems to me like the rational thing to do here is for me, somebody asked me which hypothesis is true. It's a disjunction, right? I mean, or, or you know, maybe I'm suspending judgment. I'm not sure if I'm suspending judgment there. I, I, I don't know, but it seems to me like there's this question about how we're individuating doxastic attitudes. When I say, hey, probability P, you know, 0.5 either way, flip a coin, um, or you know, maybe name your, theor make, name your favorite theoretical virtue yeah. or something like that, that that is a unique doxastic attitude that just has some disjuncts or conjuncts or something to it, as opposed to distinct 
dogs asking attitudes that I have permission to choose upon. Right? So I could believe the disjunction in response to the permissive case, or like the yes. allegedly permissive case. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I want to say something like what the evidence. Or, so maybe the unique rational dogs asking attitude to take towards this body of evidence is that this body of evidence is indifferent between H1 and H2, and that's the rational thing for me to believe. Um, Uh, loss of the yeah. So is that one is that one unique doxastic attitude that I can take that the same body of evidence is indifferent between two theories? So okay, I think this is why it's important that you're like holding the proposition in question fixed, right? Yeah. So you might think there's an attitude you could hold towards H one. There's an attitude you could hold towards H two. There's an attitude you could hold towards their disjunction, right? And then like depending on what you want to say about the case in which theoretical virtues you want to value or what your epistemic standards are, that kind of thing, it might be that different, like, you could hold different attitudes towards, you could adopt H1, you could adopt H2, you could believe their disjunction. I mean, once you believe their disjunction, it's probably, then, you know, your evidence changes and then you're probably not going to want to also, like, right. outright believe one of the, or, well, if you believe, so. But see, if your evidence changes, right, you're back to, like, the uniqueness of that, right? Well, no, 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 so the point, so, uh, if you're ever to, <laughs> Sorry, if your evidence change, the, ev the fact that your evidence changes just because uh, you form a new belief doesn't mean uniqueness is true. It just means that different uh, doc acts attitudes might be required or permitted given your new body of evidence. So both permissiveness and uniqueness want to hold the body of evidence fixed, right? Right. One move that some uniqueness people like to say or like to make is like, oh, in this case, it's not that you can hold more than one attitude. It's just that you guys have different evidence. Right, so that's a, that's a move they can make, but I mean, part of this comes down to a big question, which is like, what is evidence, you know? And that's a really big fundamental question that's fundamental at, at the heart of a lot of this literature. Okay. Um, I don't know if that fully I, answered your question, so, but. I guess, I guess what I'm trying <laughs> yeah. to get at, maybe let me try it again. What, what I'm trying to get at is I, I'm trying to uh, undermine <laughs> the link from practical underdetermination to permissivism mm -hmm. by saying maybe what practical underdetermination shows us is not a problem with uniqueness. Um, it's that what what the rationally unique doxastic attitude to take towards the body of evidence is different among competing hypotheses. It's just um, a disjunction. And then if mm -hmm. that's what I thought, then I think the problem I would have with your paper is that it looks like you're moving from the rational acceptability of the disjunction to the rational acceptability of one of its one or the other individually of the disjuncts, right? So rational H1 or H2 might not necessarily entail rational H1, right? Is that, True, but is, it's also, it's, I mean, pl plausibly, you could believe H1 or H2 and H1, right? And then maybe I, like, it's not, we want to say at least in some situations, and maybe not the one right. you have in mind, this isn't ruled out. Rationality doesn't rule this right. out. Even though it could be that in the case you're thinking of, there is one unique attitude for a body of evidence. And in some ways, I think this was also coming back to the first question. Um, right, okay. So we can talk more afterwards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Back over here? Yeah. Jim? <clears throat> yeah, I'm just a little confused about something. Maybe you clear it up. Yeah. Um, but the thing about un uniqueness and permissivism as, yeah, about doxastic attitudes and you know, the orientation that we know or should have towards the body of evidence, but traditionally understood under determination of theories and philosophy of science has been about the relationship between the evidence and the theory. It's like a formal, logical relationship rather than doxastic attitude. So are you, are you adapting that? I mean, you didn't say anything here about hmm. that you're kind of making that adaptation, or am I missing something? Well, I think the formal project, like we always hope in science that the formal project is going to work for us, right? That we're going, there's going to be a formal connection between the hypothesis and the evidence. Um, and unfortunately, Carnap failed to show that that was possible, as did a lot of people. And so I think. Uh, the current discussions on underdetermination are, are just proceed from the assumption that that's impossible or that that 
can no longer occur, that, there, that it's purely an inductive matter. So there is a logical connection, but it's one uh, inductive matter which is weighted by one's own, like your epistemic standards and how you weight evidence and all those things are involved. Implied? Yeah, yeah, and we need to make that clear, clear, obviously, that's helpful, that's, yeah, that's helpful, but it's implied that, yeah, the nature, the relation between evidence and hypothesis is yeah. now purely inductive, and that's, that's, and because of that, you, you as agent comes in to have weighting your evidence. And yeah, in the same way, maybe in the other direction, the view we need to convince this BEC also implies certain logical Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. right, yes, that there are some, like, if your um, evidence entails your hypothesis, that's not a permissive body of evidence. I think, yeah, it is good to think about, though, you know, saying, like, kind of this is logically left open between these two theories. It's a further step from that than to say, like, scientists could be rational adopting right. yes, either, absolutely. like, yes. believing either theory or accepting either theory. Right. So I think maybe that's a move we could make yes. more clear. Yes. And also, I mean, there's different kinds of underdetermination, too. So right. it could be just... You know, we're trying to think of one that is already more doxastic in nature, but that makes the project a little less interesting and kind yes. of stacks the cards in our favor at the beginning. So it might be cool to sort of start with a more classical version of undetermination and kind of build it up more from there. So anyway, that's, that's helpful. Yep, the yep. Persons. Yeah. Suppose um, you and I are adding a couple of numbers, and we're both pretty bad at arithmetic. <laughs> and you know we each get it right with 80% probability. And so we come up with two numbers. Isn't it then quite reasonable for us to take the other person's belief as equally good as our own? Because we could both be wrong. Um, if they're different, I guess we're Or wrong. equally <laughs> bad. <laughs> so yeah, 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 yeah. Equally bad at reasoning. So maybe this is another avenue by which you can get permissivism. I don't know. Or is it one of the ones you talked about? Oh, it, it's like yeah. interesting, like the backwards. Yeah. It's like I'm irrational, but you're irrational too. Yeah. So. Right, yeah. so one of us is irrational, but it's not common knowledge which, but it's common. Yeah. So it's, well, I guess it's common knowledge. Interesting. You're irrational in some sense. So we're, doing, we're trying to do our best anyway. I think that would also come down to what you peer disagreement you had. Um, and whether you thought that um, the fact that we were equally likely to get the question, 80% likely to get it right and 20% likely to get it wrong, uh, gave you reason to, give you enough reason to adopt, like if it's you and me, my doxastic added, my you know, view about the math score over yours. Um, and so I think, because there are some, there are on some views of disagreement, it's just in virtue of you having done the calculations, you should keep holding your belief, because you know that you know you you don't have any, you haven't seen any hallucinations recently and those sorts of things, and I you don't know that about me. There's all sorts of yeah. Well, so I'm actually the economist, so my idea is I, I laugh when people say mathematical proof because I do a lot of math, <laughs> and I frequently wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so just having, me having done the calculation, I know I come out with something and it seems right to me, but yeah. I, I also can step back yeah. and know that it's probably uh, wrong. Yeah. 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 I think. Uh, it might, I mean, at least, maybe not in all those cases, but maybe in at least a number of cases like that where we're both like bad at the thing, it might be just be that we both ought to suspend judgment. And so, I mean, it, you know, that might be the reason people haven't talked about them as much because it seems like even if we both get the wrong answers, we might just both be like, well, we suck at this anyway, so we should suspend judgment. So then we're agreeing anyway, you know? But uh, I think it's interesting to like think about those like inverse cases of, yeah, disagreement, so. Yeah. I think your last comment gets at this, this question that you have, and I just feel like I'm not getting something here uh -huh. about open mindedness. I mean, because we all do suck at this, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean reality is really weird and complicated, and, and we're epistemically finite. And so, so I mean, this it, it's actually true. Maybe not about our arithmetic, but there's some percentage chance that we're wrong about everything, yeah. about most things. Right. You know, so uh, take going to your last point about the way in which it, which it seems entirely convincing to me that permissiveness opens a sort of op open mindedness. But why doesn't my why doesn't my own epistemic weakness? I mean, even if I'm a even if I'm a uh, if I'm a uniqueness person, why doesn't my own epistemic weakness, a recognition of it, even if I don't know where I'm wrong, right, why doesn't that make me open? open the door for open-mindedness 
Okay. I think this is a really cool <laughs> argument for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. I'm so, I'm just, I just, I'm still, I'm not quite getting that yet. Yeah, so like, I don't know, tell me if this answers your question, but here's an interesting way to be a uniqueness person that I've never th heard of before, or thought of before. Uh, be a global skeptic, <laughs> right? Like, we just don't have enough evidence to justify any beliefs, so everyone should just be suspending about everything, you know what I mean? So, like, given our evidence, we should all just suspend, you know? Um, that's kind of interesting. I, I'm not, yeah. Arniades had that idea, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, you have to suspend belief about the truth of that belief. Believe exactly. Right, right, right. Right, right, right. right, 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 right. So, I mean, I think... What we want to say is that we're probably we're probably not uh, not skeptics in this paper, <laughs> yeah, and we're fallibles. But um, I think that's actually like a really interesting connection that like a lot of versions of skepticism would be unique for uniqueness uh, yeah. views. So I think most people in this literature are just sort of like assuming skepticism isn't true. But I think that's that's a really interesting connection that I had not thought of before. That may be so, another way of circling back to, yeah. to, to what's going on in science. Right? I mean, the reason why we don't suspend judgment when our theory is underdetermined a hypothesis is because, as you said, we never get anything done. We never make heaters, electric yeah. guitars, stuff like that. Yeah. Right? You know, we have to try stuff. And, but it's not just in science. I mean, when it comes to ethics, when it comes to raising kids, right? <laughs> it has to be a decision. Yeah. And so we, we, we can't, we simply can't, unless we're just sit, sitting around peeing here, you know, just doing philosophy, right? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so there's a sense in which the scientist is out to accomplish something. And so, and, and so she has to go ahead and try something, and maybe that will just change the balance of the or whatever, as tends to happen over time, right? But of course, the same thing is true in, in, in most really important questions when it comes down to it. We, we, we can't simply sit back and wait uh, until we're sure. We have to make a decision, and yet, if we're honest, we have to admit we might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> I've got a, a quick one. I've got a couple more minutes. Um, and I'm not familiar with this stuff at all, so this may be a dumb question. But you would. Uh, said somewhere early on about you talk, talked about epistemic theories. If I understood you right, you were it seemed like you were saying that if there there are some who might say there is no such thing as that we just can't have epistemic yeah. theories. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, nothing really comes of it, mm -hmm. um, right? So going back to that idea, so let's assuming that epistemic theories are possible. When we get to what you were talking about, the epistemic virtues, right? So we have the same body of evidence. Um, and um, we have these multiple ways that we can interpret, but those ways are based on various epistemic virtues that we apply to the body of evidence, right? Um, so, um, is applying one epistemic virtue over another one, does that change the balance of epistemic theory? That, in other words, am I no hmm. longer an epistemic theory because yeah. I'm applying um, conservation and you're applying no, really some other value and it, it seems like that could throw off the balance so that we're not really epistemic peers anymore, and the problem isn't really a problem. On some accounts of epistemic peerhood, they would deny, yeah, they would they would go on that and say, yeah, you don't have, I think Catherine Elgin's view is you have to not only have the same evidence, you have to have the same background beliefs, the same ways of weighting evidence, and the list goes on. And that just seems impossible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but but for the reasons that you're thinking of, and David Christensen actually has a footnote once where he says, and, and Richard Feldman brings this up in his like I think the 2006 paper where he says, you know, if we've got these different ways of ways of weighty evidence, and you're saying you're getting different doxastic attitudes by using those different ways, certainly one of them is more likely to get you not to the rational doxastic attitude, but the accurate one. Like it's either true that p or false that p if we're dealing with a bivalent proposition. Right. Um, but I think there's an interesting question about well, what gives you evidence that one of those ways of weighting evidence is better than the other. And you'd probably say something like a track record of getting it right, but even your track, like what gives you evidence that the way you're weighting the track record gets you right. And so you end up getting a nice evidential regress problem. Right. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So that's my way of, I don't know if you have that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's an interesting way, I think, that brings out ways in which the peer disagreement debate and the permissivism debate kind of come apart, right? right. So the peer disagreement debate, a ton hangs on what is an epistemic peer and how common are they, and the way you define that. So 
a lot of people think it goes beyond just sharing evidence. It's about sharing virtues, like you said, or sharing background beliefs, or whatever. You know, all these, you could, the list goes on and on. Similar reliability, right? Whereas in the permissivism uniqueness debate, all of it is about a body of evidence and whether a body of evidence could leave open more than one attitude, right? So I think the applicability of one debate to the other could be really, really limited, especially if you're building a lot of other stuff right. into the notion of epistemic peer. And so then it might be like, permissivism is true about evidence, but then conciliation isn't true because peers are way more like robust than just sharing evidence, something like that. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a good point um, to think about like the interaction between the two debates. Okay, well that does it for our time. Let's Thank you all. Thank you guys. <laughs>